So I'd like to welcome everybody back to the second panel. We're going to go ahead and uh, keep going this morning. Be sure to grab a cup of coffee if you haven't already and, and take your seats. No, no, we're ready to go. Uh, my name is Catherine Bliss. I'm here at the Center for Strategic and International Studies in our Global Health Policy Center and also direct a project, uh, the Global Water Futures Project. And it's my privilege to welcome you back to panel two, uh, in which we will be looking at integrated multi-sectoral solutions to bridging knowledge gaps around water management, research, education, and outreach. In our keynote this morning, we heard a lot about water pricing and markets um, and some thoughts about where the knowledge gaps are and, and why they are there. Uh, we talked a bit about agricultural subsidies, the water energy nexus. I particularly liked the coffee and donut nexus. Um, and also the need for tailored solutions to local contexts. In our panel number one, we also focused on, you know, really looking at where those particular gaps are and if there are gaps or if it's really kind of a gap in communication. Uh, we looked, again, at the issue of needing to get local in order to understand uh, where the knowledge gaps are around water scarcity. Uh, Pete Klopp talked about a perception gap and disclosure gaps as well. Uh, we discussed some important tools to both map and track water scarcity and risk, uh, looking also at the importance of ensuring better coordination between local and federal authorities, both around research needs as well as management issues. And finally, we talked in, in the Q&A as well about some of the ways in which assumptions about water quantity have shaped uh, historic practices and um, legislation in, in the long run. So this panel is going to move from an identification of the knowledge gaps to an exploration of some of the solutions that a variety of different sectors are using in order to you know, approach both closing those gaps and to improve uh, education, research, and outreach around water management issues. We'll have representatives from the public universities, the research sector, the private sector, and the non-governmental research sector as well. So I would like to introduce our three speakers for this morning. Uh, to my immediate left is Dr. Reagan Wascom, who is professor of civil and environmental engineering at Colorado State University, where he also directs the Colorado Water Institute and the Colorado State University Water Center. Uh, second, so to Reagan's left, is Kirsten Thorne, who is senior advisor at Chevron, where she focuses on energy, water, biodiversity, and climate change as they relate to Chevron's global functions, global operations. And at the far end of the table is Paul Faith, who is a senior fellow at CNA Corporation, where he focuses on research and analysis related to water management, environment, and security. So I will ask our panelists to go in, in the order they're presented here at the table, and then we'll have some time for discussion. All right, well, thank you, Catherine, and good morning to all of you. She just asked me to cut my remarks way down when she saw that I had written them up on the plane last night. So I, I'm up here scribbling and cutting, and there's a lot of things we can respond to. This has been a fun dialogue so far. I think the, the questions are great. I think we're heading in the right direction. My name is Reagan Wascom, and my role here today, as I understand it in this panel, really is to represent a, a university perspective in this dialogue. And I think all of the panelists this morning face the same challenges in that it's, it's very difficult to get our arms around all of the aspects of water, but then you throw in agriculture, energy, the environment, not to mention climate change, and the complexity really grows by orders of magnitude, too. And certainly if that complexity isn't enough, the rapidity of change, and this has been mentioned, how fast things are changing in this world under some pretty serious financial constraints. So we're, we're grappling with, so I think, some really tough questions here. In this particular panel, we've been asked to uh, discuss solutions for bridging knowledge gaps in water, uh, particularly as these sectors overlap. I think uh, what I'm going to do probably is I'll leave the so solutions to you all in the pa as we have the breakouts. You guys get to do that. I'll talk about some of the approaches that we have used in higher education to try to bring some of these things together, hopefully to, to seed the discussions that we're going to have as we break out. So. Uh, disclaimer, my perspective really is, is colored by the fact that all of my degrees and all of my work has been in the land-grant uh, university, and that's the, you know, the People's University that Lincoln set up in 1862, where we really are about practical problem-solving. And so, 
you know, I've been working at the interface of agriculture and water for about 25 years out trying to solve problems from a research and outreach perspective. And, and I would submit that I'm not sure how things look to you in D.C. I get a sense of that as I'm up here, but there really is a lot going on. There are, there are many solutions being implemented. Things are not static. The, this world is, is changing very quickly. So regarding the university role, I think it's obvious to everybody here that our primary role is that of training the next generation of managers, scientists, lawyers, engineers. That's our job, but hopefully also to train these students to work at the intersection of food, water, work across these sectors to think critically, to think broadly, and to be lifelong learners. And that's what it really takes to work across sectors. And I would submit to you that the, the problem of getting students to think across these sectors is just as difficult as getting agencies to do it. I mean, it's a, it's a vexing problem, but it's certainly one that we have to address. And the membership of the SWAC, if you look at that, makes it evidence that you know, no one agency owns water, right? It crosses a lot of different agencies, a lot of subcommittees, and you know they have different missions and goals, but they pertain to water. And I think uh, it's true to say the same is true of departments within academia. Water crosses a lot of departments. So in one sense, I think it's accurate to say that we integrate across these sectors of water, energy, food, environment, all the time when we're working on the ground in agriculture or in natural resources management. We have to do it. After all, these are systems, right? It's only really in the confines of government agencies or university departments that we have the luxury of stovepiping our attention in the way that we handle things. And examples of systems behavior abound. You guys can, can I'm sure, give examples of what, as well. But in agriculture, what we're seeing right now with the increasing cost of diesel fuel and fossil-based Fossil fuel-based fertilizers, well, producers are adopting more uh, reduced tillage, changing their fertilizer practices. That's improving water quality by reducing sediments and nutrients, but it may require some more pesticides to take care of those problems. So genetically engineered crops may confer herbicide uh, tolerance, but then they may increase our use of pesticides again. They may increase genetic uniformity of crops, and you know they may increase pesticide resistance in are the pests that we're fighting. So it's not just a problem of unintended consequences, really, but it's of policies and programs that focus on single outcomes, OK? So I guess another example, and it's been brought up once before, is this issue of ethanol pr production. The proliferation of ethanol plants on the high plains in the cen center of the United States is great for uh, corn producers. They're loving it. And, uh, you know, it's good for meeting governmental biofuels goals, but uh, it also encourages the depletion of soil and groundwater resources, hurts cattle feeding operations, uh, and there's probably other places where it pokes out as well. And that's the difficulty with systems. And of course, our world is a very complex system where all of these topics and all of these jurisdictions overlap, they intersect, they create synergies, and they create conflicts. And we just have to deal with that. Our tendency, is to try to simplify systems in very naive ways. And then, of course, we're always being surprised when systems behavior shows up. Now, clearly, the answer isn't to lump everything into one uh, jurisdiction or one disciplinary approach. That doesn't work. We need interdisciplinary, we need multi, we need transdisciplinary approaches. But think about it. The best interdisciplinary teams that you've ever been on if you've ever been on one of those that was good, what you find is a lot of really good disciplinarians, right? People who really know their subject matter, but they can reach across and they can integrate and they can work across disciplines. And so this need for well-trained disciplinarians and specialists is probably uh, the best argument for continuing the way that we're currently approaching higher education. I think, and Ed mentioned this, uh, colleges and universities are keenly aware of the need to educate across disciplines and sectors question is how do we do it? And this morning I'm going to offer uh, a couple of examples of approaches we're using at Colorado State, hopefully to seed today's dialogue. Before I do that, though, I want to propose that the current panel was really talking about water research gaps and information gaps and needs. And I guess I would propose that the, the most difficult problem facing us here today in this room is really not what are the water research priorities, okay? I think simplistically and broadly speaking, uh, the research question always is, 
how can our water management systems better adapt to fill in the blank, right? Climate change, drought, nutrient loading, in, uh, invasive species, groundwater overdevelopment, emerging contaminants, we missed all of those. These priorities change. They tend to be local, and the, the truth is these problems don't go away. They just keep popping up in different manifestations. And so what I would like to submit we think about as we break out is that our publicly funded water research portfolio has a bias towards short-term hypothesis-driven projects. And this was brought up, I think, in Ed's statements as well as in uh, some of the dialogue with the questions. And what, I, what I'm proposing is we really need a better balance of programs and projects that certainly include hypothesis-driven short-term look at research, but we also need long-term observatory networks. We need development of better decision support tools, like was mentioned earlier. We need integrated projects that work at the community or the watershed level to solve problems, to really get something done. We need synthesis projects and translational science. I would say in some cases we need just pure outreach, and this was talked about, projects that drive the knowledge that we have out into adaptation. And then last, also mentioned, we need some good old public education projects. And so to me, the actual topic, it'll change. We'll, our priorities will move and shift. But the way that we approach these topics, I think, is, is something that we need to think about. And so a couple of examples that I want to give uh, with respect to research and discovery. One approach that we've uh, implemented at Colorado State University is what we're calling super clusters. And for example, right now at CSU, we have a clean energy super cluster that emerged from a university-wide competition. The criteria was it had to engage faculty and disciplines from all across the campus in order to foster innovation and discovery. So our clean energy super cluster brought together engineers and chemists and biologists and uh, policy people. And in just the first couple of years, it spun out an algae-based biofuel startup thin film photovoltaic startup, uh, a new commercial battery manufacturer. And so this idea of you know, getting out of the silos, bringing folks together really has been uh, a spur for creativity. We're also doing that with public-private partnerships in the city. And uh, Catherine just gave me the get off the stage notice, and I'm only about a third of the way through what I wanted to tell you guys. So I'm not going get, to get to give you all of my uh, examples. We're also looking, of course, of how we integrate education across those disciplines. And as I mentioned earlier, departments and colleges, they have their place and role. And part of the way that we're trying to address this issue of bringing the disciplines together is through schools. And Peter mentioned he's from the School of Natural Resources or Environment. I forget which one it is, the Nichols School. But the idea is you bring departments together under schools and, and through seminars and, and integrative classes and joint projects, you start to get students who can think about things more broadly. We still need the disciplines, but we need that ability. To, we need leaders who are transformed in that ability in order to meet a lot of these challenges. So. Obviously, we're approaching these things, but it's slow. And the question is really, are we going to do it quick enough? Are we moving fast enough to meet the needs that are before us? Skipping through a, a lot of other really important things I wanted to say, um, Catherine, <laughs> what, what, what I think I'll do is jump right to uh, the end of my remarks and, and uh, my last page of notes here. And, and what I would say about uh, water resources. I, I had the pleasure of working in water resources management in the West. And if you work in the well, water in the West, really what you're working in is, is this arena of conflict. And some of the conflict is about facts and the science, some of it. Some of the conflict is about self-interest, my, my project, my interest. And I think the rest is really about competing values. And so in the West, we're really no longer working to develop the water resource. I think what we're doing now is learning how to share a developed resource. So we've made that transition. And my point is that the human dimension of all of this should not be overlooked or trivialized when we think about where we go from here. Science and engineering carry us only so far. And we have to keep in mind the need to study and understand how humans, how organizations, how institutions can change and adopt new practices and approaches if we really want to make headway in solving these problems. I think that once water becomes scarce in a watershed, the economic ability of agriculture to compete with urban sector, manufacturing sector, the energy sector in particular, just isn't there. 
And, you know, eventually this becomes a socioeconomic issue for us that we're going to have to think about. So before I, I yield the floor to the other panelists, I want to make one more point, and that is uh, some of you here in the room represent federal agencies that fund water research, education, and outreach. And um, what I would submit to you all is the way that you write your request for proposals or applications, the way that you select your projects for funding, and by the accountability for results that you require of your project teams, this is the way we're going to make a change on the ground. Research application and impact as an afterthought really doesn't work very well. But if you all require it, if you require accountability, you might get it. If you don't, well, maybe you'll get lucky, but I doubt it. And I would assure you all that while university faculty may not like that, they may not like being driven to, for impacts and accountability and logic models, uh, we'll respond to what's required by our funders. So I, I think we're asking the right questions here today. You know, a, after all, and this has been mentioned, we're on a vector to have some 9 billion people on planet Earth to feed within the time span of just the next generation, okay? And those same 9 billion, they want more energy and they want more water while 70% of our water is already committed to food production. And so um, you add climate change and extreme hydrologic variability to this mix and uh, the uncertainty begins to look a lot like vulnerability. So these are critical issues. I'm, I'm glad CSIS convened us. I'm looking forward to the rest of the discussion. Thank you very much. So an overview of the ways in which some universities are beginning to, to try to integrate the education of the next generation of, of managers at the intersection of water management and agriculture. And now we'll hear from Kirsten Thorne about how Chevron is approaching this in its own operations globally. So thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to talk a little bit about what Chevron's doing. And globally, um, sort of Chevron's thinking about water, uh, water management. So as you know, we're a, we're a multinational company. We operate in um, over 100 countries. But we also have sort of a unique operating footprint in California, which is where we were founded. And um, David brought up um, a number of issues related to California water. It's something that the company has been, um, you know, whether we like it or not, really forced to, to manage at the front end. We have two refineries in California, one in Richmond up in the Bay Area and one in El Segundo. And um, as was alluded to earlier with electric power, refineries also consume a tremendous amount of water for processing and cooling. And so when Chevron looks at, you know, how it's going to continue to produce energy, it has to look at the synergy between the water and energy interface. And so over the years, what we have done is we've established what we think are pretty successful public-private partnerships. We think this is a real value that the private sector can bring to the, some of the solutions necessary to move this debate forward. So in Richmond, um, the, the refinery um, has partnered up with the municipal water district and is looking at uh, building a actual municipal treatment facility on site. What that's going to enable the refinery to do in the next year or so is basically use all reclaimed municipal wastewater to run its refining processes. So we will not have to use, you know, any municipal, um, any, any fresh water in our processes in Richmond, which is pretty exceptional. I think we're actually the first um, industrial base that is using 100% reclaimed water in California. Our El Segundo refinery is, I think, somewhere between 60 to 70% reclaimed water. Um, and is also working with the municipal water district on increasing the capacity. So these unique opportunities are something that um, politically, um, you know, Chevron had to, had to step up and take note of because of the operating environment of California. And now we're trying to take these best practices and move them to places like the Middle East, right, where um, politically water is not something that's necessarily talked about for a variety of reasons, at least on the energy production side, right? They build big desal plants and they sort of call it a day, but we really know that that's not necessarily going to be sustainable for long-term production of energy in the Middle East. So um, another example that I think is important is um, the industry, kind of writ large, produces a lot of water, right? A lot of water comes up when the oil comes up out of the, out of the reservoir. And so looking for innovative solutions on what to do with that water is something that Sh Chevron, as well as a number of other large um, oil companies, are looking for because it's a lot of water. We produce more water than we produce oil at the end of the day. And so we've got to find a way that we can reuse through treatment and, and, and reuse that water. And, and one um, sort of novel approach happened a few years ago down in the San Joaquin Valley. It's just outside of Bakersfield. We were able to partner with local farmers 
to actually get them to take the, the high quality produced water and use it as irrigation for agricultural crops. Now, that has been a interesting point of discussion with lots of folks who say, is that really the best quality water to be used on agricultural issues? So it's brought up a number of sustainability questions. It's a solution that has worked. It, it's actually allowed the farmers to use this, this water in lieu of taking water from other sources. So it's, it's, it's freed up some additional um, allocation, but it fundamentally, it, it, there are questions still to be had about how you can use that uh, methodology wide, you know, long-term widespread across industry because not all produced water, as you well know, is of the same quality and some simply can't be reused. But it is an opportunity where it's fit for purpose and, um, and, and meets the regulatory requirements. So one thing that the oil industry in general has gotten very, very good at is integrated risk management. Um, we operate in, in some very complex operating environments. Um, they're challenging on a number of social, environmental, and um, sort of just physical levels. And so it's really important that these robust risk management tools that integrate the water and energy intersection as well as land use planning, that they get stronger, that they incorporate the tool the tools that Piet talked about, you know, things that WRI is doing, things that Jemmy is doing, things that the World Business Council for Sustainable Development are developing. These are tools that allow you to look multidimensional. You look at the local level in terms of water risk management. You can look at the regional level. And then, you know, World Business Council allows you to look at a much higher level to say, to, to, you know, to be able to evaluate, okay, if I look at this, you know, series of water risk, energy risk, land use, ecosystem risk kinds of questions, I can make a better educated, um, uh, you know, analysis of where my footprint is going to impact and then what I can do to potentially mitigate those impacts. And I think that's, that's something that not just oil and gas, but industry writ large, the beverage companies are also very, very good at this. Um, it's something that is, is, there's a lot to deploy this kind of risk management system, but it needs to be done. It needs to be integrated. It needs to start to, to consider the, the value of ecosystem services in a much more robust way. We, we've heard that from previous, the earlier panel. We still don't have a very um, reliable way to value those ecosystem services, and I think until we do that, number one, it's going to be very difficult to value water. And if you can't value water, we obviously have seen the consequences of that. So, so the tools that are, that are out there and, and the organizations that are working on this integrated ecosystem services valuation, I think we've got to continue to help fund and promote because I think that's a key element in any comprehensive risk management system. So. Um, another area I think the private sector can add some unique value is, is technology. Um, not necessarily Chevron, although you know we obviously drill and uh, lay pipe pretty darn well, but there are a lot of companies in the private sector that do this um, for a living. ITT is one. Um, I would encourage all of you, ITT is launching today a, a, a study that they did of um, 1,000 registered voters in the U.S. looking at a, a litany of, of interests and risks around water and what consumers their mindset and their willingness to pay to change the paradigm would be. And so that is available, I think, on ITT later this afternoon. They're over at the Atlantic launching that as we speak. But what it does do is it talks a little bit about the political paradigm. And the fact is that it's going to take more than political will to shift behavior, right? And one of the things that, the, that I have to say the energy companies are, are getting very good at is energy efficiency. We haven't heard a lot about water efficiency today and conservation, and I think that um, there are an, a myriad ways to, to incentivize here in the United States people to use less water, to use water more efficiently. Um, it can be through building codes, it can be through, you know, EPA's water sense programming, it can be through state and municipal kinds of incentives. I think that that has to be part of, um, part of the landscape. I also think that if we can link it, I'm not, I, I'm not sure how to do that, but if we can link it to the distribution of energy, there is an incentive for everyone, even people who are in water abundant areas, to think about if they, if they reduce their water consumption, they can reduce their energy costs. Clearly, you're going to have decoupling issues, and you're going to have issues with electric utilities and the monopoly of the water utilities, and you've got to get through all those issues. But I think that coupling those together makes some sense in terms of local distribution of those resources and the incentives to change behavior, which we know at the end of the day we're going to need to, to drive. It's a little bit of a different you know, paradigm when we move overseas and into the developing world, right? Because you have people struggling to, to simply get, you know, get enough water every day to live. And so 
another area I think that the private sector has some value in is capacity building. You know, we operate in places that a lot of other people don't have access to. I mean, very few people want to operate in the Niger Delta for very, very good reasons I fully appreciate. But there's an opportunity to use Chevron's and, and Shell's asset bases in the Delta to start to deliver service-oriented um, approaches around health services, around water services, sanitation services. You know, you, you can bring to bear those assets and resources that are already there, that already have established themselves in these places. You partner with USAID, you partner with development agencies, you partner with the banks. And, and, and other private corporations for, for sure, and you can build a more robust system where the government can start to see that there's value in the resiliency of having systems created. It also, it, at this point in time, there's a perfect entree with, with adaptation because these systems must be strengthened regardless of what we decide to do about water policy or these communities are not going to make it, right? So there's an entree here with adaptation and country adaptation planning where the private sector and the public sector and civil society can come together and frankly I think could com come to terms on some very specific ways to help increase capacity and increase the resilience of these communities um, and, and at the same time provide water and health services which you know are clearly a value add. Um, I think I just wanted to hit on the point that, that, that Reagan made uh, in the industry one, we have a gap just in general with, with enough resources, enough employee resources, right, engineers coming into the industry. But I think what's really important is I think there's still a fundamental gap at, at universities where, they're, where engineers are trained as engineers and, and they go through their academic programming in, in a very, you know, very robust but very streamlined way. And I think, you know, whether at your Colorado State or, or Duke has a new center that they're launching um, uh, through the Fuqua School of Business to look at how to prepare the future, the, the, the energy systems workforce of tomorrow to be able to appreciate and, and to better take into context the kinds of risks that we're going to face in order to build out the energy system that you're going to need in 20, 30, 40, 50 years. We all know that we're not going to be dependent on fossil fuels for the rest of our lives. We know we're going to make that shift into low carbon energy and it's going to come over time and it's going to be developed, you know, in, in a responsible manner, you hope. But we also have a track record of developing policies around corn ethanol that, that don't really serve, at least on their face, the purposes of you know, carbon reduction and or appropriate resource management. And so we've got to get a way for the next generation to appreciate the, 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 the intricacies and the complexities of these systems so that they're better equipped to make sound policy determinations not that doesn't necessarily answer the political question, which I know has some issues. Um, and then the final question I would like to just leave you with, um, you know, we have, um, we have the, um, the energy agency here in the United States that is kind of the repository for energy-based data and, 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 and work that they collect. We don't have something kind of on that same magnitude for water. Recognizing the USGS does a very good job for, for what its mandate is, but thinking about something that could potentially um, you know, bridge the various agencies and provide a, a house and an information opportunity, a knowledge management system, basically, for water data around um, what David was alluding to this morning, you know, understanding, what, you know, tap water quality, understanding distribution of, of um, you know, various water rights and appropriation of water rights, understanding, you know, aquifers and, and how they recharge and what levels and what time frames. That may be something that could help. It would be apolitical, you'd, you'd hope. Um, and it would provide a nice baseline for us to be able to tap into, you know, all over the country um, as we try to do better water resource planning. So, thank you. Kirsten, thank you very much. Uh, so we've heard a bit about the <coughs> private sector's expertise in the area of water extraction and issues, technical innovation, distribution mechanisms, and a view uh, from the private sector of the role that universities can play in training the next generation both of engineers and also policymakers. Uh, we will now turn to Paul Faith of CNA for a perspective from his organization. Thank, thank you, Catherine. What I would like to do is, is uh, briefly, um, as briefly as I can, cover three topics where I think uh, cross-sectoral interest uh, approaches um, on the part of the governor in particular, but uh, others as well, would actually um, would tie in very well with water issues and would uh, help us to solve some um, significant problems. The first I'd like to cover is water quality, then energy and water, and finally water and conflict overseas. Th the water quality, I think, as we all know, I'm going to skip the data aspects of this, but um, 
we do have a significant water quality problem in the United States. We've gotten to the point where the Clean Water Act actually worked on uh, dealing with point sources, so agriculture is left as the, the major source, but we need to, in many areas, still go much farther. Uh, the Chesapeake Bay, for example, is struggling with this issue right now to reduce nutrient loadings. Um, and one of the things that, the way that we handle this is with the uh, point source control and then non-point source subsidies, it, um, David Rich, uh, talked about this problem earlier about this kind of this mix of, of ways of treating this problem that lead to uh, an unknown cost, unknown values, and even difficulty in terms of, of price discovery, in terms of what it actually costs to deal with this. So I think one of the, the gaps that we have is gaps in water data. We don't actually know the situation in water quality. There's, we don't survey very often or, or very widely. And so even for the regulatory effort and for the subsidies that we're spending, I think we don't really know what we're, what we're really buying. In fact, it's even difficult to, to track in the water quality aspects, you know, um, what are the, um, the extent of the problem and what sort of are we buying in terms of reductions. So I think um, one of the things I'd like to talk about is um, the way that we actually handle this policy problem. And, and a way that I think um, would draw in, a, um, draw in a lot of people, both at the local level but also sort of the federal level, is to look at market-based mechanisms. And I'd like to talk about two of these. The first is nutrient trading or water quality trading. And the second is uh, using market-based approaches for the farm programs. One of the things that we know with nutrient training is that there are a variety of different costs, and in any, in any dealing with any kind of problem, you're going to see a variety of costs in different actors. And what nutrient trading can do at a very local level or even at the level of the Chesapeake Bay where it's being talked about now, setting that cap, and then the key thing is to allow different partners, different um, actors within the, within the community who have the lowest cost to have that price discovery happen and let those with higher costs to buy those and then be able to use those to set, uh, set them off. And well, there have been some examples where this has been used and a lot of analysis on this that shows that uh, uh, compared to basically our approach right now that nutrient trading could actually deliver a lot of, of, um, of improvement in quality for a relatively uh, lower cost. The second aspect is what we, the way that we handle the farm programs is it's, they're largely volunteering the conservation programs that uh, it, it, who walks in the door first often gets the money. And, and uh, targeting is anathema in, in U.S. policy. You know, everybody, every state has to get a share, irregardless of the aspects that are being contributed. A farmer may be uh, you know, not contributing to water quality or other problems and may still get funding. So one of the things I think we need to do here is go to an economics called the monopsony, which is basically one buyer and a lot of sellers. WRI, a few years back when I was there, actually did a study looking at, in the Conestoga Bagan, Basin, comparing the purchase using $500,000 at the lowest cost from a group of farmers until the money ran out, and then compared that with analysis on a county next door where it was the traditional equip program. And what the analysis showed that for the same amount of money, you could buy seven times the reduction in nutrients if you used a market-based approach. And what leads me to on this conclusion, in thinking about you know, the, the broader question is, uh, hypoxia was mentioned earlier. I think we actually have enough money around that if we actually spend it efficiently, I think we actually get a, a lot more improvement in water quality. And energy security. Alan mentioned earlier that this is, uh, this is really our principal security issue in the United States. What we're looking for here in terms of how energy security is currently being defined most often is secure supplies at reasonable cost that are climate friendly. That has been in the last 10 years become really sort of the, the norm. And what I think we need to add also is that uh, respects water constraints. There's been very little analysis and very little discussion within the policy aspects of these things about the constraints that water may provide. Uh, the the uh, drought in Atlanta was mentioned a little bit ago by Pete, and one of the things that, that happened there that or almost happened, I should say, uh, there were 24 nuclear power plants in the region that was under uh, drought that were within a week of having to close down. 24 out of 102 nuclear power plants in the United States were that close to having a, a significant supply of energy having to be closed off. The issue, although it's thermoelectric cooling, a lot of areas the water withdrawals are themselves important. And I think there's been examples here that are coming up of how this is going to bite. For example, um, a study just a year or so ago suggested that there's a 50-50 probability that by 2017 the Hoover Dam may not be able to produce electric power. I actually I was out in San Francisco not long ago and I asked uh, a member of the Bechtel family the Bechtel company was one of those that actually built the dam, and I thought they'd have a perspective on this. I said, do you believe this 50-50 number? And they said, no, we only think it's 30 percent that actually won't be able to draw water. And, and I was really kind of shocked by that, because I would have thought they said, 
you know, that study is a bunch of BS. But they actually agreed with it. And that's, um, you know, one of the issues here is that the water is going to be a constraint. You look at alternatives like shale oil. Uh, requires, you know, two to five barrels of water for a barrel of oil. It's also in the Colorado River Basin. Subjects to ethanol in the President's budget, about $39 billion, $36 billion, excuse me, in uh, ethanol subsidies for what is really the most water-intensive option for developing transportation fuels. Electric cars, a lot of talk about how we can use um, charging at night because that's when the electric, uh, electric uh, um, capacity is not being fully used, but really no uh, conversation that I've seen at least about, you know, the amount of water that would be still have to be used at night to provide uh, electricity for things like the Nissan LEAF. Um, when you look at carbon capture and storage, there's a 30% energy, energy penalty. That's kind of the range, the mid-range, what people talk about. That means that there probably is going to be a 30% water penalty. And how are we going to, the question is, how are we actually going to do these things? And what I've seen is that, um, like I said, very little discussion on, on these things. One um, uh, piece I saw that was from an, an energy committee hearing, and they were talking about the hydrogen economy, and one of the comments was that water is basically an inexhaustible resource. And I just thought, you know, that just kind of typifies sort of where we are in trying to look at these issues. So I think we do need, the aspect here I would say is, is uh, there's been a lot of these roadmap studies, but very few of them, when you look through and look for water, they say water heating is the, comes up a lot. But the discussion about water as a constraint really doesn't come up at all. And I think, um, I think we really have to figure that out and, and do a broader water assessment. That's one of the things that we are doing. Last topic, how many do we do for time? A few minutes, okay. Um, there's a lot of talk often about uh, water wars, and this was particularly a hot topic uh, earlier um, in uh, this decade, in the kind of the late 1990s that uh, a lot of discussion about, you know, water is the next oil, uh, those sort of things. When you look at the research, though, what actually comes out is that um, water is not a cause typically for war between countries. It actually can more often be a cause for collaboration. But it can be a cause for internal conflict in places that are already um, have low capacity or are weak or even failed states. And this happens in a couple of ways. And, and the reason that this is a security issue is because these sort of failed states, and you see Afghanistan as an example, Somalia, Yemen, all places with water problems, and those have become places that have been uh, terrorists, um, havens for terrorists. And it's part of the reason why the U.S. is concerned this issue that um, this doesn't go very far down these ways in trying to look at how you can actually avoid uh, state failure or weakness. Four ways in which water contributes to places, again, where there are already uh, issues of, um, of, of governmental ability. First, through water degradation, looking at you know, things like um, safe drinking water, sanitation, just the general degradation of the resource and how it impacts the economy. Food insecurity, obviously, uh, in times of, uh, of, of food insecurity, there can be a whole range of problems that come up that are challenges for countries. Storms and floods, you said just Pakistan, for example, not long ago, a uh, huge issue. And finally, the issue of migration, which impacts and is, and is caused by the other three. And all these can have a, an effect on the way that uh, states can become weaker or, um, or, or even fail. The uh, problem is particularly worrisome in Africa, where there are 19 of the 25 weakest states in the world. Again, you know, what we see in these things is the, uh, when countries don't have the ability to respond, have low capacity, then it, uh, and, and the instance of this has been increasing since the 1960s, that the more often than there requires an international response or, and often a, a defense or military response in times of crisis, and that's a, an issue. The knowledge gap here, I think, is that we really don't know where or how to respond to these sort of challenges, and all of these aspects will be made worse by climate change. And so partly as an adaptation response to climate, but just because they exist now and are already causing significant problems, I think we need to figure out for ourselves and with um, other international partners, what are going to be the responses to these sort of things? You know, they're bad now and as they may uh, continue to get worse. But I think particularly um, looking at um, di uh, development, diplomacy, and defense responses. And again, that's sort of a cross-sectoral look at things that we need to pull together and figure out as these uh, problems continue to exist and get worse, what are we going to do about them? And I'll, one minute, so I'll stop. So we've had a review of university,
contributions and efforts to promote integration across the variety of different sectors, a discussion about the ways in which Chevron and other private sector companies are thinking about ways to use their own expertise to um, work with partners um, in the United States and in countries where they have operations to better address uh, the linkages across water, agriculture, energy, and the environment, and a discussion about the ways, you know, particular focus on, you know, the issues of water and energy challenges and water insecurity, and the ways in which, you know, again, some of these efforts around uh, broader private public sector discussions on development, uh, diplomacy, and, and some of the security issues can promote both dialogue and um, efforts to identify promising solutions in the long term. We have time for some questions and commentary from the audience. Let me ask you to wait for a microphone if one is available. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and just please uh, state your name and affiliation, and uh, we look forward to your comments. So I think there was one question over here, please. Thank you. Uh, Craig Zamuda from the U.S. Department of Energy. That will kind of give away my bias in terms of where my question will be going. And the fact that we have a Nobel laureate, Secretary Chu, kind of in charge of our department, will give you some sense of a promise that we hold out for technology in terms of addressing problems like energy water. So with regards to technology, let me go back to, uh, to Mr. Watson, Dr. Watson. Uh, your comment, I think, was uh, science and engineering can only take us so far found that kind of intriguing. Kirsten, you came back and kind of talked about how technology is taking us further than where we, where we are today. So the question I would pose is, what role does technology hold out for a possible solution to this water issue? And why are some people basically not addressing that issue this morning and, and others, thankfully, from Chevron here, glad to see some focus on technology. Uh, but uh, for those folks that think there is a promise for technology, how far can technology take us in terms of addressing the problem? Great question. Thank you very much. So <clears throat> I think one way to look at this is there's, there is not a water shortage on the planet. There's an energy shortage, right? We're awash in water here. It's just got salt in it. And so how far can desal technology take us, for example? One of the things that's happening in the West is most of the water projects that are being built now tend to be off-channel uh, reservoirs, and they're doing this for environmental reasons. And so how do you get the water where you want it? You pump it. And so the energy footprint of water is really increasing as well. If we can move, so the main problem with water is distribution and quality. So if we solve the energy problems, we can solve the world's water problems. Regarding technology for desal and other ways to clean up water, I think there's a tremendous amount going on there. And I think technology is going to take us a long ways. I really do the, the work in smart membranes and other type of systems to, to clean water up uh, is progressing, I think, relatively fast. But it's still an energy problem in terms of the cost of that water. And then the, the other part of it is the disposal. So just like the produced water that was spoken of, the, the wastewater stream that comes off that, the brine, You've got to do something with it. And so, again, we need technologies for that. I think we're doing a better job at learning how to create brine than we are of learning how to deal with brine. So, you know, right now the, the tendency is to re-inject it in class two wells, right? And we want to go to zero liquid discharge type of approaches. There's some work to be done there. I, I actually think technology holds part of the solution. I mentioned the idea of uh, genetically modified crops. There's tremendous work going on in Monsanto and Syngenta and other places really on a race to develop uh, crops with higher water use efficiencies. And um, I'm, I'm less optimistic about that being a solution because we know that plants require a lot of water. 99% of the water that goes into a plant blows off into the atmosphere and goes back into the hydrologic cycle because of the way plants capture carbon, they also release water. and so. You know, I know USDA DA is working on this vigorously, Mike, and we're looking forward to what you all and what Syngenta and Monsanto come out of on that. But I think fundamentally food production is a really interesting question that Peter brought up because it takes a lot of water to grow food. And how we break that linkage, I think it's going to be whoever does that, they get the next Nobel Prize. Um, I cannot speak at all about the 
energy and food uh, relationship because we don't do food. But what I can say is that you know over the years the, the efficiency of the energy system has gotten exponentially better. Um, however, we also have the introduction of unconventionals that are water intensive. There's no doubt about it. Um, you know shale gas, shale oil, um, you know heavy oil. There's a lot of water that's needed to produce these fuels, and so. You know, even though we can we can do it almost approximately close to a producing a barrel of light sweet crude, it, it's still a barrel of water per barrel of oil. That's pretty much the standard in the industry, and so that's that's still a sizable amount of water when you think about how many barrels of oil are produced every year. So so there's no doubt that that technology is getting us to a point where you know we're we're able to extract um, more energy, right, at lower costs theoretically, but but that doesn't necessarily help us with the input. So the input of water um, and the energy needed to create energy is still something that we struggle with. Because at the end of the day, if we can get those input costs down, the bottom line is helped. And so we, we have, um, you know, the industry is investing quite a bit in how to bring down the cost of those, the cost of the input and also the amount of the inputs into the system. And so we, th we believe that if you can do that hand in hand, like we're doing it in Richmond, right, we're reducing, we're reducing the amount of water we're intaking and we're changing the type of water we're, we're inputting. So that's lowering our treatment costs at the end of the day um, uh, because of the, because of the closed cycle system that we've installed, you know, that's going to help drive down the price of energy at the end of the day. Um, it also lowers our energy input. But it is a balance because the, the, the closed loop it is energy, you know, it, it, there's an energy footprint to that, which is, which is different than if we had, say, once through cooling, right? Um, and so these are trade-offs that I think are just now beginning to be understood. So while the technology, I think, and, and I think speaking on behalf of the company, we believe the technology will get us there because we've seen technology get us to a place that we didn't even think existed 20 years ago. In the, in the ability to, to extract some of these resources, um, there is still a tremendous amount of work that has to be done on balancing the trade-offs and making those difficult choices. I mean, even solar power has a significant water footprint depending on the technology. It's not, it's not, you know, and it's not a solution that, that is devoid of, of the water challenges and certainly the land use challenges. Um, but, you know, you talk to people, GE, ITT, you know, talk to these people who, who develop these amazing capabilities to drill. So we can, we can access the water, you know, we can drill deeper, but that doesn't help us on the sustainability side. And so while I think the technology between providing the, the appropriate energy mix and the access to water over the long term is going to be there for us, it, it doesn't it doesn't help us necessarily solve the question of which is going to be more important, how are you going to balance those factors out, and, and that, that's a policy decision, it's not a technology decision. A, a couple things there in, in your question, I, um, I think technology has brought us a long, long way, there's so many advancements in so many areas, even with agri agriculture there are technologies now that are being used that are reducing the amount of water used to produce the same amount of crop, et cetera. But I think we need not only innovation in technology, but innovation in policy. And the key thing is economists talk about is uh, the theory of induced innovation, that you have to have a value, you have to have a reason for innovating something. And again, this goes back to the whole question of the, the value of water or even the price of water, that for something that's not valued, then there is no inducement to invent new technologies to actually manage that problem. So uh, look back to like, the, ac the acid rain program, and a lot of people uh, before that program was put in place were thinking, well, we're going to need all these new scrubbers and all this very advanced technologies, the answer was put in place was actually to use um, low sulfur coal. It was a very, very simple solution um, and, and there has been still a driver for you know, a further technology that has come about through that, but I think that's the aspect. And I think so we need, there's a lot of policies that we have in this country and I would cite the farm um, conservation program as one where, you know, if you could just kind of, um, get from reverse into neutral, and uh, you can do a lot, and you don't have to know everything in order to figure that out. But I, I think, um, you know, the other thing with technology is giving a, um, an incentive to actually adopt what technology has actually been developed. Hi, I'm David, uh, is this on? Yeah? I'm an economist. So um, I wanted to hammer this panel's answer, uh, 
hammer it in as a good answer and more hammering, not against it, so to speak. Uh, but it was in respect to this uh, technology will save us meme. Um, I've heard it many, many times people say we just need more supply, we just need more supply, we just need more supply. And as an economist, I have this other hand, which is the demand side. And I wanted to uh, bring up what the panel alluded to when they said trade-offs. There's a cost and there's a benefit to each of these things. And what we want to look at in terms of a water shortage is how much does it cost us to bring another unit of water on the supply side which is desalination, for example, which is quoted around a dollar a cubic meter, for example. And how much does it cost us to reduce demand by a cubic meter? And it turns out that it might be more like three cents. I, one of my favorite examples is in Gaza, which is a very controversial place, and they talk about water shortages, and they talk about a desal plant there. But most people don't know that 70% of the water in Gaza is used for agriculture, right? It's not used for drinking water. Someone earlier said, uh, if we don't have water, we die. Well, that's true, but the amount of drinking water out there is a tiny, tiny, tiny amount of all of our water use, so I won't go further than that. And, on, on, and I wanted to, to actually talk about two things that Paul said that were very interesting. One is he said that the SO2 auctions was one of the good ways of solving the, um, at the lowest cost, the problem with SO2 pollution. And I don't know if you saw the recent news of the analysis, but the SO2 auctions died when the regulators changed the rules and the market collapsed. Right? So when we talk about policy solutions being very important, they're not, they are the only thing sometimes. Without a policy uh, in place, there was no SO2 auction, and when the policy changed, it collapsed. So this is something to pay attention to, and I think the panel is very right to emphasize policies are a good tool to now start to think about compared to technology, technology, which we've known about since the Roman and the Greek times as far as water is concerned. So that was essentially my little bit of hammering. So, um, do I get to respond? You do. Yes. Thanks. So, uh, uh, David, the Colorado Water Institute just did a study in Colorado where Doug Kinney, who you may know, um, looked at the cost of new water supply in Colorado, today's market, and we looked at what does it cost to build a new, per acre foot, new on-channel reservoir, to move that water from agriculture to city and then to uh, implement water conservation. The surprising thing about it was you would expect the cost of new development to be high on the order of fifteen to twenty thousand dollars per acre foot of new developed water. Um, compare that to the cost of conserved water in Denver or Aurora or something, and that's about five thousand bucks an acre foot is what he came up for by the time you implement the programs and do the education, et cetera. But the cost of transferring water from ag to city, and maybe this doesn't surprise you, but it did me, is more on the order of twelve to fourteen thousand dollars. And the reason is that the right now, the way we're set up, the transaction costs are very, very high to move that water. So I thought that was interesting. And it goes to your point about changing the demand function. We have time for one more question, if there is. OK. Yes, sir? Yeah. Hi. Um, my name is Sundar Rangacharya. I'm from Monsanto. So far, um, I've not heard any discussion of about um, salinity and the encroachment of the, the deltas with more salt coming in and how how that's going to impact and maybe what role technology can play there. I'll tell you what someone else said about it. <laughs> um, I, just, I, suck, I just saw a presentation on this actually last week and um, um, it, you know, my sense of the whole thing was that it's, it's uh, a, just a huge problem that getting solving one of the things that was the most shocking facts that I heard about was that the delta itself has subsided because the water's been taken away so the organic material has oxidized and the the lowest point in the delta is now 15 feet below uh, sea level so um, if the levees so if something were to happen to the levees um, they would all be flooded with with seawater so it's, it's, it's such a bad situation that, and there doesn't seem to be a very good answer for all this but the person concurred with what David said earlier that you know we've spent all this money hundreds of millions on research why don't we just get started in doing some things because it again the political stalling but um, if they they do have some solutions that could be put in place but they're they're they look like things that it's gotten to a point where it's almost insoluble it seemed to me anyway all right well we've had a very interesting discussion of multiple sector approaches and efforts to coordinate on policy technology, 
education and outreach around water management and its links to agriculture, energy, and the environment. I want to bring this panel to a close. Let me ask you to join me in thanking our panelists. <laughs> and I want to turn to um, Jim, and I'm going to say your name wrong, and I'm Jim sorry. Dobrowski. Dobrowski. Um, well, that was close. Please forgive me for that, um, for some instructions uh, regarding our working lunch. So. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Jim Dobrowski. I'm from the National Institute of Food and Agriculture with USDA, and I'm standing right here next to your luscious lunch in anticipation of what's coming next. Um, we're going to be uh, the